Thank you. Um, so in case you're wondering, I'm in Vancouver. Uh, it is raining, not snowing, as usual. Uh, and it's 9.30 at night. So uh, it's nice to be talking to people in the future. That's uh, my one, uh, you know, cross the international dateline joke for the evening. Um, this uh, presentation, I apologize if I'm, I'm going to try and go through it fairly quickly. Uh, I've done it before in 20 minutes on the nose. Uh, but uh, I, I, I learned very quickly in their little practice sessions that when I do this online, uh, I tend to have a tendency to take a little bit too long. But um, let's, uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll kick in. Um, let's see if I can make the screen move. Excellent. So, oh, and just like all the other presenters, I've, uh, I'm learning the controls quickly. Um, welcome to the new normal. I want to talk today about a little bit of context around the research industry and what the digital world is, is uh, what, what the digital world is doing to consumers. Uh, the uh, the presence of the mobile phone is, and that being a single digital device that is portable, is changing uh, consumer behavior like we've never seen before. And what we see happening is, is that information is moving freely available between consumers and between brands and, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a revolution that we've never seen before through uh, that has been fueled by social media but obviously uh, also driven heavily by uh, uh, mobile phones and uh, the constant connectivity of consumers. And this connectivity allows uh, consumers to personalize their experiences as they go through this digital world through apps and digital devices. And what's really happening is that today's consumers are truly different. They're able to engage and capitalize on these technologies at their fingertips. And, and we as researchers have have to mimic these expect expectations in a digital world. The, 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 rea the reality is, is we're, we need to think very different uh, as researchers. The old methods of marketing research are simply not as in, uh, relevant and engaging in today's new world. And so I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the obvious implications for market research and how we need to think different. A concept that we're playing with a lot at Ipsos is called uh, socialized research. And socialized, the concept of social, socialized research really focuses on blending, uh, blending aspects of technology into the craft of marketing research in such a way that we are able to garner more relevant and engaging and more timely insights for our clients. In the old world of marketing research, we used to talk about sample and surveys and measures and reporting. And in the world of socializing research, we need to think we need to start with a new nomenclature that where we talk about people, experiences, and stories. Socializing research, in our mind, can, 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 can comprises three main buckets of uh, methodological approaches: active, passive, and in interactive. Active is really taking our, the survey research craft and changing it a little bit, shortening our, our questionnaires, uh, making them layered, gamifying them, taking our craft and changing it just a little bit. I also believe that in the future, as we socialize more of our marketing research uh, approaches, we're going to have a very frequent integration of passive and interactive solutions in every study. So passive obviously would be what we learned from respondents in uh, through passive devices, mobile phones, click search and share data, and interactive is learning from consumers as it relates to how uh, brands are communicating directly with respondents through co-creation and social media. So for the rest of my presentation, I do want to talk a little bit of the experimentation we've been doing with passive data, specifically around uh, Facebook's uh, social media data. Facebook's an interesting study. Uh, it's recently topped 1 billion users in the world. Uh, one could argue that they're becoming the world's largest panel given that there is a, a significant amount of opportunities for us to sample from Facebook specifically. Facebook is also an interesting uh, beast in itself because of the 
amount of information it has on consumers through its uh, social graph. Facebook is an excellent reflection of my life, and this is a, a very quick snapshot of, of my Facebook page, a picture of my wife and my daughter, and it contains stories that tell pictures about my life, pictures of my daughters, and perhaps more uh, unfortunate uh, photos that uh, you know camera happy friends upload. And I'm really hoping this is getting a chuckle, so it's intended to. My likes also tell uh, an interesting story about my life in terms of what sports I follow, food and beverages, travel, professional uh, politics. Um, it really has become a reflection on my life. And as we started to think about this, this you know, this gold mine of data, it, you know, you, when you start to think about what you can learn, but by, by just looking at consumers' Facebook and, uh, profiles, you can look at their demographics, you can look at their interests, you can look at where they, what their activity is like, where they're checking in, life events, and their social graph, which is actually, you know, potentially a little bit intrusive in, in the world of, uh, as it relates to privacy, but, uh, but. The interesting thing is, is that it's also an area of uh, significant opportunity for, for analysis and uh, uh, data collection. Um, what I want to do is map through an idea that we had that allowed us to kind of do some experimentation with survey research and connecting with Facebook data. And it starts off with your typical Ipsos respondent. Obviously, they'll all look like that, but, you know, um, we, we push them to an, uh, an Epsos survey, and we have the ability through a button that Facebook has on many, many websites called Connect with Facebook. It's a button that uh, allows applications to access the Facebook social graph uh, and allows the, uh, the, the application to pull the respondents' information into the application, so demographics, interests, etc. The shocking thing was that actually Facebook actually allows the application to seek permission to see all of that respondent's friends. So I can, through one click, you can violate all your friends' privacy by having uh, a Facebook application share their data with uh, to a third party. Um, when I learned of this, this was a little bit of a shock to me. It was my expression, not exactly my picture, but it was certainly the expression on my face. <clears throat> After it sunk in a little bit, I thought, well, why can't we use this as a data collection tool? What is it that we can learn from Facebook social graph data to inform uh, our marketing research insights? So we started experimenting with it, and I want to walk you through very quickly a case study that where we tacked on this Facebook Connect data onto an Ipsos Media CT syndicated study this summer in the United States. Uh, it was a daytime television viewing study, and we tracked awareness, past viewing, intent to view, engagement with various daytime TV programs, all designed to really give our, our clients in the, in the media space some insight around upcoming television programs uh, for, for the daytime segment uh, in the fall. And we did 600 interviews, and we used the login with survey button, and we kept things simple. All we did was ask for the Facebook profile data, page likes, and number of friends. We could have done much more. We could have asked for their photos. We could have asked for their friends' photos. We kept it very simple. Um, and we got 294 people sharing their Facebook data with us. But when we, we were doing this, we had all sorts of questions in mind. What can we learn from Facebook? Can we rely on it? We had a, I had a lot of people tell me that I was a little bit crazy and that uh, there's, there's millions of fake Facebook Facebook uh, profiles out there, and you know, could we rely on this kind of data? And to what extent are those willing to share their Facebook data with a researcher different from those who were not willing to share? Um, I'm not going to walk you through the respondent experience. You can uh, follow up with me later, but it was, you know, gener it generally follows a typical opt-in respondent uh, opt-in experience you'd see in any other research survey. What we learned: first of all, I want to talk about demographics and, and the comparability. We, we obviously looked at those people who did and did not share their Facebook data with us. And on a demographic perspective, those who shared their demographic, uh, their Facebook data with us were almost demographic, demographically identical to those who did not or refused 
to share their Facebook data. The two very, very slight exceptions to the rule were African Americans and college grads who were slightly less likely to share their Facebook data with us. And when I say slightly, I just I do want to emphasize slightly. We also we also went into this experiment thinking that uh, tech tech savvy respondents might be more willing to share their Facebook data with us because of their uh, affinity or relationship with social media. We so we included a device ownership question in the survey to try and uh, you know understand to what to what extent that hypothesis was correct or incorrect. And what we found was that there is absolutely no difference between the two groups in terms of the, the device ownership. So the same rate of owning all the latest tech devices, all the really low tech devices that you should see in all the in in, uh, in various different types of homes. So we were very satisfied and very comforted when we started seeing some of these uh, relationships. The other thing that we did is we actually looked at you know stated age and gender versus their Facebook age and gender. And we saw a very, very high rate of matching stated gender and Facebook gender. We also saw a very high rate of matching age versus age, right? So generally, you've got a few people on the outliers who are either younger or older. Typically, there's a little bit of a bias towards saying that you're, uh, you're younger on Facebook than you would say in a normal survey. But again, we were very comforting comforted with you know this high rate of matching. So we were very happy when we started to try and identify what we can learn from all these Facebook likes. So the first thing I'll talk about is, is that this the sheer volume of data that came in from these 274 respondents was, was a bit overwhelming. Um, we had the, 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 the Facebook likes come in as a string, so we had to get our coders to code all the strings, and they created 21,000 different codes, each one representing a different page from Facebook. And so this was an obviously overwhelming code frame, something that our, our actually our coders had never seen before. Um, we also learned, interestingly, that the average user in our study had 149 likes. So it was a lot, a lot higher than I would have thought. And and we actually truncated artificially eight respondents who had liked more than 1,000 pages. And when I talk about likes, by the way, I just want to clarify that I'm talking about page likes, not the likes that you have on a comment. So this would be, you know, if you've liked the Coca-Cola page or if you've liked uh, the page for Wesley Snipes or any other uh, person that has a public page that you can you can click like on. So. We then started to look at affinities or, 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 or the rates of, um, uh, of which viewers of different daytime television programs over-indexed on liking different types of pages in Facebook. And so we looked at, for example, uh, the show Wendy Williams. And I'm sure if you're sitting in Asia, you probably don't know who Wendy Williams is. I actually don't either. I don't watch a lot of daytime television. But according to Wikipedia, day, uh, Wendy Williams is an, she's an African American talk show host, and her show skews African American. And so when we started to look at what likes the viewers of Wendy Williams over-indexed on in Facebook, lo and behold, pretty much every one of them was an African American uh, icon of some kind, ranging from Barack Obama to Oprah to Tupac to Fresh Prince. And so this this seemed to make a lot of sense to us that there is this very uh, very logical and apparent correlation between the show and its demographics and what people are engaging with in a social context. We also we did this for for all the daytime television programs. I'm not going to talk to all of them, but the viewers of Anderson. Anderson Cooper is a daytime television talk show. He's also a news anchor on CNN. Anderson's viewers over indexed on 71 different page likes, a, a significant allow, uh, amount. We were a little concerned when we saw things like Dog the Bounty Hunter. It made us scratch our head, not sure uh, how what the correlation is between Anderson and Dog the Bounty Hunter. Uh, and again, if um, if anybody in Asia and, and Australia doesn't know who Dog the Bounty Hunter is, Wikipedia and Google Images will tell you very very quickly, and you'll you'll have a good laugh. Uh, even visually, you'll start to scratch your head. Um, but after examining the patterns of likes in the in that big long list of 71, viewers of Anderson seem to over-index on uh, some things that seem to correlate, like 
Uh, three different pet, pro, pet food brands were listed there. Five different health and beauty brands and three brands of baked goods were listed there. And so, you know, we started to think, well, would this help us make, uh, conclude that Anderson viewers are more likely to have pets or are they more health conscious or perhaps they just like to eat, I don't know. But again, it was it, we were getting the sense that we could actually create some insights from this type of data. And not only that, um, you know, there were some correlations between uh, their page likes from Facebook and some of our other syndicated work on Anderson. So we were, there were some, there were some uh, interesting learnings there. We also learned some interesting things around social engagement. Um, what we did is, is we took every daytime television show and we plotted the show in terms of its reach, which is on the x-axis in this uh, in this graph, and we plotted also the amount of net social activity that the respondents had for the show on the y-axis. And the obvious relationship that you see on the graph is that there is a there's a strong positive correlation between TV show reach and social engagement. And it kind of dispelled the myth a little bit that there were some shows that that regardless of whether or not they had a a very good reach or not. In terms of audience size, they that they weren't there weren't any significant outliers in terms of their net social activity, and so this led us to believe that you know what's really happening here is there's this online double jeopardy effect where larger the larger shows draw a disproportionate amount of net social activity, and it kind of dispels the myth that if you want to grow your show and grow the reach of your show that you should somehow in, uh, grow it by engaging with your viewers. Uh, through through social uh, social activities such as uh, Facebook and Twitter and that type of thing, and and then finally what we did is we actually labeled the shows that fell above the line of average or below the line of average. And what's interesting is the the shows that all fell above the line of average all, all had hosts that had a high emotional connection with their audience, whereas the shows in the bottom uh, underneath were all P, uh, court shows or game shows, and it kind of what it's what it kind of told us is that the, there's you know if you were to look at this data and you had a show that fell below the line of average, uh, one way to improve the um, the rate at which your viewers engage with your show is to actually um, get your host to more emotionally connect with your audience. So some interesting findings around that. But what's what what we also found was all this interesting data that we were collecting from Facebook was extremely difficult to push through the normal operations of a market research company. And, it, and, it, and it, so it presents us with uh, researchers with three problems. And I think, first of all, it presents us with a uh, respondent opt-in experience. Uh, obviously, we have to tackle privacy issues in various countries and, and to the extent that legislation will uh, potentially shut this avenue for collecting data down in the future is uh, you know, to be determined. And I, re I and I remain a little bit pessimistic around you know the researcher community's uh, ability to to do this in a positive way because um, we've done we've shown ourselves to you know shoot ourselves in the foot in the past. The other thing that I'll talk about is the coding and tabulation ch challenges. Um, the Facebook data comes in as a JSON string. Again, Google it if you're interested. But I'll tell you, it's not natively compatible with SPSS Dimensions or Confirmant or Ascribe or any other data collection software the research community uses. And then finally, it, it presents us with an important data visualization challenge as well, because those 21,000 likes that I was telling you about actually created a crosstab that had 21,000 rows in it. It was something that I stared at for many, many, many months. Um, and I had to actually start to create uh, macros to distill the data down in some meaningful way, but it, obviously when we start border, you know, getting into this world a little bit, it does present us with some data visualization challenges. So my presentation is obviously, you know, if it, it's the end of market research, so we feel fine. So the question is, if it is the market end of marketing research, why do we feel fine? And I think because one of the things that we learned from doing this is that. This Facebook data would have allowed us to extend the utility of our study beyond the scope that we would have done otherwise. And all we had to do was get respondents to log in to Facebook. It was like a, it's a 30-second exercise. They use their username and password. And this kind of 
data would have allowed us to, you know, identify a correlation between Anderson and viewing the show Modern Family, and they could have used that for pre-promotional spot decisions, or they could have also used it for, you know, identifying particular advertisers. There were some correlations between Lysol, Cheez-Its, and the Lenovo. And so the, the key finding here is learn more in less time, and we could have learned things that we wouldn't have known to ask about in other situations, right? So uh, most studies in, in media don't go into uh, the relationships between brand usage and, and that type of thing. But we got that information from Facebook without asking any questions. We also have the opportunity to eliminate questions from our survey, such as demographics, and it adds contextual information, you know, to the extent that we can pull data uh, in the form of pictures from a respondent's uh, profile and look at their wall posts and their friends, obviously allows us to add contextual data that would be very difficult to collect in a normal survey experience, uh, in a normal survey. So, you know, findings like these are just the tip of the iceberg, and it really, you know, the opportunities are truly endless when you start to think about the amount of data that Facebook has and how you can pull the data and push and, and merge it with a uh, survey in terms of looking at the number of posts broken down by photos, videos, or status updates. We could look at measures of influence. We could look at check-in behaviors. We could look at, you know, uh, beta. The Facebook is beta testing a want button. So we don't know how consumers are going to use the want button, but it's uh, reasonable to assume that they will use it in a different way than they use likes and to the extent that we can merge that with the survey and, and use that as a uh, point of analysis presents us with lot, lots of opportunities. And so, you know, I just want to wrap up by say, suggesting that, you know, the opportunity really is a bit of a blue sky. The best way to predict the future is to create, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do with uh, this uh, notion of Facebook data. Thank you.